The mission of my Veteran Foodie Podcast is to educate you, the military-connected food and beverage entrepreneur, by inviting different industry professionals to talk about their experience running businesses and hopefully offer some valuable advice to running your own business. This episode, I was super excited to speak to Will Lutz. He's a Navy vet. He's an ex-nuke submariner. And we speak about his experience running a couple of different startups of his own, as well as running an incubator for entrepreneurs starting up their own business. Very well versed. He's a professor. He likes to talk a lot, which is super informative and valuable. So take some notes during this episode, whether it be on your computer or writing them down, because he speaks about some really important, valuable business advice. I mean, we speak about the importance of knowing when your idea of a business sucks and how to validate that it doesn't suck so much, to put it in layman term. And we also speak about the importance of customer discovery and how to do it right and how to validate your business using a strategic approach. So I hope you enjoy this one. Like I said, take notes. If you enjoy this episode, if it brings value to you, give this video a like and subscribe to my YouTube channel. Leave a comment below if he hits on some topics that help your business or if you have some questions that maybe Will can answer. One one thing about all you uh, nu nukes is uh, I, you guys got a certain way about you. I can tell you're all, always very smart. I've ran into a, quite a few nuke vets before and you guys... You guys got a little something extra going on in, in the head, I think. So I, it's, yeah, unfor unfortunately, the something extra is not always great. <laughs> like, I think I think we're all a little crazy, which uh, very much, I think nukes make great entrepreneurs. I, mm -hmm. I think they're killer business owners. There's a, there's some quote out of Harvard or something that like entrepreneurship is trying something new with very few resources and it, when you're stuck on a sub out in the middle of the atlantic and things break you have zero resources you got nothing and uh so I, I think it makes it makes a lot of sense so yeah hi nice to meet everybody i'm will <laughs> it does that I'm does a make nuke. a lot of sense i'm a former nuke former nuke yeah tell, yeah tell me about your nuke experience a little bit so how long, how long were you in the Navy for? You were in for a few years or you did a while? I did, I did, I did five and dive. Um, my five and dive. So I went, I went to school on an ROTC scholarship. Um, wanted to be a pilot actually. And turns out I get incredibly air sick and, um, uh, fell in love with submarines during one of my midshipman cruises. Uh, and then ended up in the, the submarine force and, and did the whole Rickover interview in the nuke school and prototype. And then uh, I was stationed on the USS Miami for three and a half years or so and left directly from the Miami into grad school and startups and started starting some companies. Um, so, yeah, no, I, I was a Groton sailor, a lot of North Atlantic European stuff. Um, yeah, it's 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 one of those things like everyone's so within the Milvet community, like this is a different sort of conversation, but when I talk to civil people who have no military experience, like, oh, I can't even imagine what was that like? I'm like, that was just my job. I went right from college to that. I didn't know what a normal life was supposed to be. I didn't know that. So like it was how was it like? It was my life. I don't know. What what do you want? What do you want from me? And um, so it's just it's just a funny thing because to outside people it feels so foreign and weird and oh I could never do that I'm claustrophobic like well it's a four story tall machine it's 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 huge and yeah it's 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 crowded and cluster and you know closed up and you can't go anywhere but you forget you I'm just working man this is my job and. Um, it's, it's, it's a weird one though. It's weird because you can't explain it to people. There's what I usually describe, and this is what most submariners will do is they'll say, uh, life in a submarine is 99% down periscope, 1% hunt for red October. And if you <laughs> don't know those movies, if you don't know those movies, go watch them down periscope, hilarious, hilarious film, Kelsey Grammer, I want to say late nineties, but I don't remember. And, um, uh, Rob Schneider, Kelsey Grammer. It's just, it's a riot of a film. It's, it's a, it's a hilarious film. 
Um, but it's they're playing tricks on each other. They're being goofy, and like that's submarine life is is like really boring sometimes. Like it's really boring. Like you work a lot, sure, but people are like, oh, is that exciting? I'm like, you didn't want that to be exciting. <laughs> that's one of those things. Like if you wanted that to be exciting, you're you're expecting World War Three pretty quick. Uh-huh. And so, um, yeah, we had a hunt for an October moments because that film was also very accurate, but a lot of it was being silly and bored and just working hard. So, yeah, no, I've, and then I, I left the boat directly, uh, didn't know what I wanted to be when I grew up, um, didn't know any of the language, any of the vocab of like the outside world, and ended up going to, business school went to b school just because that was a i thought that was a good transition Mm -hmm. like i didn't i didn't know what my options were i went um i I sort of knew i wanted to do startups or tech in some way but i didn't really know and uh so i went to business school started uh, a tech company and caught the tech bug and i've i've started now uh I've either started or helped start four different tech startups. I've been involved with a couple of nonprofits. I've taught, um, I, I, I helped start a startup in the food and beverage space, actually. Hmm. Um, it was called Unlimited Brewing. Worked for a buddy of mine uh, named Neil Sony, who's a phenomenal entrepreneur and founder. Unlimited Brewing's whole thing was, we were a two-sided marketplace for craft beer. Hmm. So instead of you go to a conference and you usually get like crummy little pens and notepads and stuff, Mm -hmm. we would work with a company to develop a craft beer with their name on it Ah. and either sponsor like a happy hour or or sell it, or Hmm. usually you couldn't sell it. Usually there's some legal stuff and selling it. But we navigate, and there's all sorts of like weird laws around beer and alcohol, and so you have to get a unique recipe. You need to get the right brewer. You need to, and so on one side of the market we had these big business enterprises. It wasn't like custom beer for your birthday party. It was the Wall Street Journal and the Economist magazine, and oh. um, uh, I, I feel like we had Deloitte at some point. We had one of the big four, anyway. Um, I'm re- I'm not remembering that correctly. And um, you, you go to the other side and you go to a craft brewery and we had a database of something like 200 craft breweries knowing what their brew schedule was and when they had excess capacity because that's a tough business to be in. Hmm. It's a very low margin business. Yeah. And so if, if, if you, if you want to say, Hey, Hellman's kitchen needs its own IPA. Mm-hmm. And you just knocked on the door of a couple of craft breweries, nine out of 10 of them will tell you to bug off yeah, because they just, they just don't have the capacity to run their slim business. And so we kept an eye on their, we had a, basically a database of brew schedules and we knew who to call to make this happen. That's interesting. And that was a, that was a fun way to spend a year and, uh, a way to put on another like 10, 15 pounds that my wife thinks I probably didn't <laughs> need at that time. Because I just, I spent all of my day, I spent a lot of time getting breweries on the platform. And so I just spent all day at craft breweries, just like bouncing around craft brewery to craft brewery to craft brewery. That's a tough and life. You, you always, <laughs> yeah, it was a tough life. It was <laughs> tough. Um, and then, uh, that, and then from there ended up, that was a fun company. That's my only sort of exposure to the food and beverage space. Mm-hmm. And then, um, ended up at NGIT in Newark where I ran their commercialization department, helping professors and faculty who invented stuff in their lab, how to start startups. Um, I, I ended up running the largest startup incubator in the state of New Jersey through that helped create a, a little venture fund for alumni and, um, well, had a lot of fun. Like, and I sort of fell in love with deep tech there, deep tech, hmm. climate tech. So yeah. Yeah. So you got a pretty, pretty interesting, diverse background coming, coming from, a living on submarine for, for a number of years. It's uh, what, what a route, huh? It's interesting. So mm-hmm. did, did, did you say, did you start your first company while you were in school at the time or was that right after school? 
I actually, so I actually started my, my first sort of tech startup was in undergrad. Okay. Um, back when I was, I, I started with some buddies that I ran cross country with. I was in, on the, on the cross country team and another, another group of really weird people, hmm. just like long distance runners are weird groups of people because <laughs> you get on like a 15, 20 mile jog run. And you just talk about the dumbest stuff, just the dumbest stuff. And so through that, we ended up, somebody was like, hey, we have a crazy idea. That was when the web 2.0 revolution was big. <laughs> For those of you who are old enough to remember the buzzword web 2.0, <laughs> um, Facebook had just come out. And um, we were figuring out, we started a company to try and leverage that tech in, in sort of different ways. Um, mm -hmm. But that's, that's another story for another day. So my, my first startup was an undergrad, which is why when I left the Navy, I was like, I want to go do something in tech. I don't know what, do something in tech. And then um, my, my second company, which is the real company, that was my first acquisition. Um, that company was, that company was the one that, um, kind of, I, I started at the, the week I started business school and took it through all of my business school. And then a year afterwards, and eventually got it acquired. Um, now were you, were you using the, uh, so that the was, GI bill yeah. when you went through business school? Um, remember a very small amount, if I remember correctly, Interesting. um, cause I, I left that for five years hmm. and I used ROTC. Uh. So. R ROTC like pushes the GI bill when you start earning GI bill back a lot. Mm -hmm. And I didn't earn a lot of GI bill benefits if I, because I just, I just hadn't sort of worked off the ROTC mm. I see. I requirements. Got you. I, I only asked cause I, I, I found it interesting. So it seems like some vets like to start uh, businesses while in school cause they're able to collect housing allowance and kind of like, it's almost schools are side hustle to starting a business, you know? So I was, I was just curious yeah. if that was a, that was the route. <laughs> That's a, I, so I did, but like, even, even if you don't have the GI bill, mm -hmm. you're, you're probably going on loans cause you don't have a page. Like if you're a full-time student, you're generally going on loans. And I think it's a great time to start a, a startup or business because you're living off of the loans. Yeah. And What's the hard, like if at the end of the day, after two or three years or whatever it is, if your startup bombs, mm -hmm. you still have the nice piece of paper on the wall. Exactly. So I have like mixed feelings about business school. I think mm -hmm. it gets overused a lot. Fin finance bros love a good MBA on their, on their resume. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, but for the military vet crowd, it is a phenomenally useful uh, certification. Mm -hmm. It is a, it, it's it's great for career switchers, and there's nothing more career switcher ish than a military vet leaving and, and figuring out what to do when they grow up. Mm -hmm. And um, the MBA is great for that. Um, not well, less so for the finance bros and the banking bros. Yeah, sure. sure. I just thought that was a little silly. Yeah, but um, great for mill vets. There's not a mill vet I would recommend some form of. And what I what I wish I knew at that time was. There's a lot of other like two year degree programs that are similar to MBA hmm. that aren't MBA that can be way, way more interesting. The so I went to I went to Carnegie Mellon and they had this two year program that I often oh shoot, I'm blanking on the name. Um that was combined between the computer science school uh. and the business school. And it was about cre it, the whole program was just about creating a new product or startup oh, no kidding. and launching it. That's cool. And business business school is a little more general in the business sense. And if I had known about it, I just, it was just like from the boat mm -hmm. and, and for me dry dock for a little bit, I didn't know that there were options. Yeah. yeah. So um, it's one of the things I often recommend to people who are considering stuff like go, there's, there's similar stuff, like whatever, like little passion area you have, whatever you're interested in, mm -hmm. guaranteed I can find just something that will, you can use your GI Bill. You can tra you can give yourself some breathing room as you transfer. Like, yeah, terminal leave only gives you so much breathing room. Exactly. Now that's a great point. Yeah, there's a ton of um, are they masters in science programs or MS is the acronym for them that specialize in yeah. certain fields. So yeah. 
Great, great call. So, so you're talking yeah. about earlier about your idea sucks, right? As, as the concept. So let's, let's talk about that a little bit. What's your idea on there? Yeah, this is, so this is, this is a particularly like, so this is something that like gets at my core um, because I, I taught at a university, I've taught graduate level courses, and I've seen people teach lean entrepreneurship and agile entrepreneurship, which is like such a Silicon Valley buzzword in some ways, <laughs> and it ticks me off. And people don't, I, I've seen so many like programs and people not teach this well. And so, um, like, and like we almost fetishize entrepreneurship. And in, in this country, in our society, like entrepreneurship is like, we, oh yeah, I'm a fucking entrepreneur. Let's do this. Right. And, um, one of my personal like pet peeves is a lot of startups fail because people hang on to their idea too tightly. Hmm. And the whole concept of an idea is miserable and it's terrible because a good entrepreneur. So. A good entrepreneur is a skeptic. A good entrepreneur looks at their concept, looks at their business and says, I don't believe, I, I do not believe in this. Um, and until it's proven back to me, hmm. until I can validate it by talking to customers or, or selling a product or selling a service. And I, I just don't believe it. And what, what happens is um, your original idea is going to fail. No, no startup in their original form ever is successful. It's just not a thing. And what bugs me about it is that um, there's lots of good ideas, but people don't understand what's good about them. So what ends up being wrapped up in an idea is a whole bunch of other concepts. So you've got sort of a, a, a customer problem statement You've got a solution or a product or technology or all three. You've got a business model. You've got a go to market thing. But in your brain as the founder, you just call it an idea. And in reality, one of those things is broken, maybe, maybe two of them are broken, and two of them work great. And when people stick too close to this concept of an idea, they end up squashing what's really great because like, oh, okay, well, my go-to-market strategy sucks. But they don't see that in their head. They don't perceive it. They're just like, oh, my idea is not going to work. And what they really should be doing is breaking up ideas into these hy separate hypotheses around their business and their business model and validate them individually. So you can double down on the ones that work well and throw out or start over on the ones that don't work well. And so it, it, it kind of comes back to this concept that, listen, my idea sucks and I have to start there. And if I start at this concept of my idea sucks and what about it sucks, I'll actually end up with a better business. I'll end up with a better startup this way because I'll, I'll figure out what about my idea sucks. And because of like sort of the cultural elements behind entrepreneurship, you have to be resilient because everyone's going to tell you that you suck. Everyone's going to tell you your company sucks, your startup sucks, your business. Everyone's going to tell you that. And so to be successful, we build into our brains and everyone will teach you to be resilient and to stick with it. And in, in reality, you learn way, way more and build a more resilient business with that skepticism that's, that's baked into that idea of what that idea is. And so that, it, 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 it peeves me out. It, it really peeves me because it throws me, I'm trying not to swear too bad. Like I'm trying, Go uh, for it. <laughs> I, know, I know you said I could, but I, I'm trying not to be a, a jackass. Um, it, it takes me off cause I've seen such great ideas or great concepts bomb because especially in the very early phases, because one of those like different little like sub segments, the little parts of that foundation, suck and just sort of masks that the rest of the idea sucks. And so I, it, this thing, I, I have this whole workshop and you're basically getting it at this point, which is um, the whole concept of an idea sucks. It just, it's a, it is a shitty concept. 
forget an idea. Go go and, and break your idea into its component parts and figure out which one of them sucks. And then fix it and make double down on, on the good ones. I got listen, man, we we've known each other. I think it was through NYU. I think it was an NYU program, yep. right? Mm -hmm. Um if you're a military veteran, you're thinking of starting a business, go check out some of the NYU programs. They've got some phenomenal entrepreneur programs. Um, if I bet when I first met you, what you were working on that time mm -hmm. and what you're doing now, th there's some pretty solid differences there. Oh yeah, it, absolutely. It's like, and, and ever I've done, I've been a part of four uh, startups and um, founded founded companies and sold companies, none of them look like how they started. Mm -hmm. None of them look like how they started. And so it's it's kind of an art form to figure out what of your idea is good and what's not. And so that's why I really, I try and like coach people on like, start from the point where your idea sucks and then then build back, build on top of that. And then you won't you won't get that kick in the shins See, I'm censoring myself again. Kick in the shins, the punch in the shins that mm -hmm. happens when your startup bombs. You just, you're like, oh yeah, of course it sucks. Of course it sucks. I'm, but it's just the, it's just my pricing model that sucks. <laughs> my product's great, so I'm I'm gonna, I'm gonna fix that part, and we'll go do this again. And so yeah, that's. Sorry, that's I. You got me on a something that just like it spins me up and gets me really angry. Because I like so many good companies have died, especially in the early, early phases, like at the university level, the incubator level, mm -hmm. um, early stage training programs, like just good concepts die because they can't let go of this thing as a, as a whole unit, as opposed to little individual parts. And if, if you don't mind me segueing into something else we talked about, mm -hmm. it has everything to do with engaging with customers. So, um, there's another, there's a, what's Guy Raz's podcast? Uh, How I Built This. Hmm. How I Built This. There's a great, um, a great episode with the founders of Instagram where, and I can't remember the guy's name off the top of my head, but he talks about when, when products fail or, or services fail, the thing that founders ask the most is why aren't people using it? And I've got to go, I've got to go figure that out. And what he sort of figured out, and he has this great story of his talking to his wife on the beach, taking pictures and filters and stuff, when he had this sort of aha moment, what he should be asked, what you should be asking is why do customers love what you've got? So it, you're going to find somebody who loves it. Don't try and fix the ones that suck. Dig deeper into the ones that really love it. And the only way to do that is to talk to your customers. The only, only, only way to figure out what works and what doesn't work is to talk to your customers. And so that digs into this other sort of thing that like gets me spun up, which is nobody knows how to do customer discovery right. And I don't want to say nobody, but lots and lots of people don't know how to do discover, customer discovery right. Or... They do it, they, they apply the wrong customer discovery tools to the wrong aspects of it. So like the, so like this is, there, there's, um, I, I think I have in my notebook, there's seven different forms of customer discovery or, or some, seven different types of customer discovery that I used to teach when I was teaching. And, um, you get into Steve Blank and you get into Eric Reese and you get into the lean startup and everyone will say, Hey, let's do customer discovery, but nobody, it, it, it's rare that it's taught how to do it well. And so, and, and the, the biggest mistake I see is people, um, uh, sort of overlapping open-ended interviews and target interviews, which if you, if you're, in the social sciences world, these are very different things. And they, if you're an early entrepreneur, you have to do customer discovery. You have to engage your customers. You got to talk to them. You got to get that feed lab, 
feedback loop going so that you can really build a good product and, and make your customers happy. But the um, thing that gets mixed up is that as entrepreneurs, we're not social scientists. And so we don't know how to do these human interaction conversations. We don't know how to do these interviews. So we're making it up off of like blog posts and YouTube videos, right? And hopefully somebody like the Vetrepreneur program or whatever teaches you some of it, or or you come to one of my classes at the Vetrepreneur program and I teach you some of it. Um, and so we mix up these things. And I'll, I'll give you a really good example. I'll give you a really good example. People think in, in our brains, we like, we, we sort of take this concept and mix it up where um, we like to ask questions that are very quantifiable because we're thinking about customer discovery as a scientific thing, which, which is, it is, but it isn't. And so you get a lot of customer discovery processes that'll be stuff like, Hey, how often do you check your email per day? And th there's a number there. That number exists. It's for me, it's like 300 because I check every, you know, 30 seconds or I've checked it five times since we've been talking. Um, and that's, and that's an okay tool, but it very much limits what information you can get. You, you can only get a number. And so what I usually coach people on and, uh, and this is this is coaching I got from when I was in an incubator, a lovely woman in Pittsburgh named Kit Needham, who I strongly recommend if you need a mentor and you live in Pittsburgh, go talk to Kit. Um, Open-ended interviews, you need to be surprised. You need to let yourself be surprised. And the only way you do that is you ask questions that will bring you a story or it'll bring you reasoning or it'll give you the why that's behind stuff. So you really don't want to ask questions like, what do you think of my product? Give me some feedback on my product. Cause it's, it'll bias your customer to what you're trying to do. And it will force them to put bounds around what they're thinking about to give you that answer. And so, what I, what I like to do is when I do customer discovery and I've done it hundreds of thousands of times probably now, I have no idea how often I've done a customer discovery interview. And I usually start by saying, hey, listen, don't, I'm not gonna tell you what I'm building because I don't wanna bias what you're doing. I'm gonna ask you a bunch of super open-ended questions and just, just dig into however you feel. I used to say that if you could get a customer to cry in a customer discovery interview, you've done a really good job because you found something super emotionally engaging for them. And that's like, if you get somebody like yelling at you or like some emotional outburst of some kind, you got them telling you like the real shit versus whatever corporate bullshit that they have to give on a day-to-day -day basis. And so I, I like, I wish I had an example off the top of my head. Um, like, so if, if, if I were starting a restaurant business, mm -hmm. um, the sort of things I would do for customer discovery and customer discovery questions, I would, I would talk to some customers and I would ask them things like, tell me about the last time you had a phenomenal experience at a restaurant. What happened? What was it like? Tell me, tell, where were you? What was going on? Tell me everything. And, and the next question is why? Why did you feel that way? Why did you have that experience? And then I, after getting some great answers, I, I'd flip the script and I'd come back and I'd say, tell me about the last time you had the world's shittiest restaurant experience. Why, why was it so bad? Why was it miserable? What did you not like about it? And um, that's, and people, you get a story. Now, now 
uh, I'll, I'll add this sort of can sometimes it's harder to pull nuggets out of stories but you're at least getting something real if i asked you how many times do you eat out per week and what restaurants do you go to i'm getting a very clinical answer that's as an early stage business owner i can't actually do much with um and so if it's if you're doing customer discovery and you prep some questions beforehand, be prepared, and you look at the questions and they're asking yes, no questions or quantifiable questions or uh, whatever that's like gives as a distinct answer, then a multiple choice of some kind, like those are bad questions for early stage customer discovery. And you, if you're putting out the questionnaire, you don't even want to mix these two up. Do, do them very separately because you might get to a point where like, okay, well, to validate this business hypothesis about what I'm trying to build, about my idea that probably sucks, I might ask some very specific questions that have numerical or yes, no answers. And um, that's going to be very, very different. Um, I actually have a good story. This is, okay, I have a great story this is this was given to me i was allowed to share this with permission from uh one of the directors of notre dame's uh startup incubator i don't even know if he's still there um there were these student founders and they had this idea of delivering food via drone in the middle of a concert in a concert venue it was it was uber eats plus drones in a concert. Huh. And their whole sort of problem statement was, their whole problem statement was, it sucks to get food at a concert. Okay, Fair. I get that. If you're, if you're in an, op especially in an open air concert where you have like a blanket out on the grass and uh, like- Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> And like you got to climb over your your girlfriend at the time and over some <laughs> random people and like what and then you coming back with like beer and French fries or whatever and you're still in that shit and like <laughs> it, it sucks right and so their idea was we're gonna use drones to deliver food so what these kids did um, over the course of a summer every Friday and Saturday they were there was a concert at their local at the local venue and um, they resolved to do a test. A hypothesis test at each one of these and the way that they did it they printed out a hundred flyers that said would you like food delivered to you yes or no go to our little google form and fill out yes or no let us know and i i forget how big the concert venue was but a hundred you know it's way bigger than it's thousands of people they hand out a hundred flyers at random after the concert, they check the numbers and they get like 80% of people say yes. Okay. This is something that maybe there's something here, right? They do it the next concert and um, they ask, okay, would you like a hot dog delivered to you? At the con yes, no. And their plan was to man, like before they ever built a drone, was to run their asses all over this concert venue and hand out hot dogs. Like if you said yes, tell us where you're sitting and we'll deliver the hot dog to you before they spent any money on the drone. Um, and during that, they got, if I remember correctly, it was like eight or nine yeses out of a hundred. And, and so you pause for a second and say, I got 80, 80 out of 100 one day, I got 8 out of 100 the next day, what changed? Well, we introduced this concept of the hot dog. Okay. So they, the next concert venue, they do it again. They say, would you like a hot dog, french fries, or a can of soda? And um, they got 7 hot dogs, 12 french fries, and 82 cans of soda hmm. through that little form out of 100. Well, this is interesting. Maybe it's drinks versus food. Maybe maybe we should only deliver drinks. They did this the entire summer, and they couldn't figure it out. Now they got a lot of good data. They got they clearly are dedicated to using manual minimum viable product, 
you know, methodologies, lean startup methodologies to validate different hypotheses. They test price points, they, they test age, they test their customers. They test all this because it was a really nice controlled experiment. Hand out a hundred flyers, do you want this delivered to you? Yes, no, pay us, whatever. And they didn't have to build a drone because there's only a hundred flyers. You can run a hundred hot dogs around. Um, it wasn't until they talked to customers that they figured out what the X factor was. The X factor for them was prepackaged versus not prepackaged. So if it was a prepackaged food like a bag of chips, a can of soda, a bottle of water, people are willing to buy it. When they talk to a customers, they figured out, and again, with open ended interviews, not yes, no, would you like this? Yes, no. They figured out that people wanted to see the little hot dog roller. They wanted to see if that looked gross. They wanted to see the French fries under the heating lamp. And this was surprising to them. They didn't know this. And so when they ended up building the drone, they ended up building, if I remember correctly, and I, I, I hope to goodness that I'm remembering the story correctly because it's been now seven or eight years, um, that they built a drone that exclusively delivered bottles of water. Because it was prepackaged, it didn't need to be heated, it didn't need, uh, people didn't want to see it. It solved all of their, and it was a lot cheaper to build and a lot more successful. And if I remember correctly, they raised a lot of venture capital money because they had all of the data to back it up. And, but it was important to inform that data with the open ended customer story because they wouldn't have figured out that, you know, this whole concept of like, I want to see the beer tank. Like, is it real gross? Which, I mean, if you've been to a concert, an outdoor concert venue, and you go to those concession stands, yeah, I get it. You know, yeah. like, I, I'm going to go, and I'm going to go, oh, man, that hot dog roller, that looks, they haven't cleaned that. Some teenager, <laughs> college intern hasn't cleaned that all summer. That's gross. Mm -hmm. Like, it makes sense, right? But it would have never come up in the quantifiable experiments they did. Um. And they, that's a great example. I use that example also to teach people how great experiments are because you can learn a lot from it using that sort of controlled MVP method, which it is, it is a minimum viable product. It's, uh, it's what we would call a uh, concierge MVP, um, which a whole nother conversation about different types of what MVP is. Hmm. But um, – yeah, it's it's. I think it's really interesting as an example that's that's real to inform like how important open ended customer discovery interviews are. How how important is it to talk to your customers and let yourself be surprised, and throw out your script if you find something interesting. Open up something that you never expected, and you you'll you'll find those are like that's the nuggets that get really good customers and real a really good business design. So. Okay, that's the end of that soliloquy. I have been talking at you for like, see, I, I used to teach at college and college class, so I can just talk. I can talk for like three hours if you let that's, me. That's great. Um, well, makes makes my job easy. <laughs> yeah, that's that's my goal. My job is to make your job easy. That's what I'm here for. Um, <laughs> but yeah, there's and there's, if anybody wants, there's a lot of literature out there on the internet or in blogs and stuff on how to do customer interviews well. And whether you're a small business, a big business, a tech business, uh, a, a lifestyle, it doesn't matter. Um, you have to talk to customers and you might as well figure out how to do it well so you're not wasting your time. Um, so yeah, it's, it's sort of my pet peeve. Ideas suck and customer discovery is not done well. And if I could teach every entrepreneur how to do customer discovery better, I'd be a very happy human. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, yeah. So yeah, that's the end of soliloquy. That's that's it. normally this is where I'd ask my class if they have any questions. Perfect, perfect. Or I, I'd put them on the spot and make them do a customer discovery interview with me. Nice. And I would be a real genitalist about it. Mm -hmm. Because I, you know, I was like, train these kids how to do it in the real world. And for mm -hmm. all words, it's nice. That's so, a good point. That brings me to what I was wondering. You were talking about when your idea sucks is getting that 
you know, what if you get that false validation that your product is good from your, your friends and your family? What do you say to those people? Ignore your family and friends and go out into the outside world and get that negativity elsewhere? What are your thoughts on that one? So, uh, so yeah, yeah. So I have, if you're talking to customers and you're doing a proper customer discovery process, friends and family are great for form, but not form and function not the actual data you get back. So if I ask a question, how do you feel about um, a, a concert food? And your answer is great. I now know that that question sucks because I got a one word answer back. But it doesn't actually give me a ton of data around um, like what it is I'm building and how to make my product or service better or company better. And like, man, I have pitched, I've pitched a lot of ideas to friends and family because that's like the world I live in. And mm -hmm. my mom loves me. My mom will always say <laughs> that, I, she, oh, you're going to be, this is going to be great. Like my mom, like my dad won't, by the way, my dad will give me like an honest answer, which I, I mm -hmm. think is right. Um, he'll he'll really he'll get me but my mom oh honey this is this is love so and and we'll lie to like we will lie to our family we will lie to our family to their faces because we don't we don't want to hurt their feelings so i'm very skeptical I, friends and family are great because they can tell you honestly sort of the meta sort of aspects of it but they they, they almost never give you good data like go Go get your training wheels on with friends and family, but don't yeah. don't believe anything they say. Um, that's that's yeah. good advice. Mom, mom that's, I wonder how many moms are responsible for tanking different businesses. <laughs> right, right. Like in my, in my post in my post mortem blog post when I come <laughs> come clean to the world about my startup bombing, like it was mom. Mom, was mom just fault. like kept telling me, kept like building me up, and I was like, oh, this is great. <laughs> um so, yeah i don't know i don't know that'd be great that's interesting so another another thing i was wondering too when you were talking about getting those hard to quantify emotional stories where you're making people cry potentially in customer discovery and pulling out those different nuggets is that you a team of people or whatever it is creating a process where you is it like uh, maybe you write down their responses in text and you break out sentences to pull out nuggets and categorize it? Is it that in depth or is it not so much? Yeah. So, um, so if you can, if you're doing if you're doing customer discovery and you're doing it right, if you can ask, ask people if you can record them. Um, if you're like me, you'll never listen to the recording though. Um, and <laughs> I have to like transcribe it with some app so I can read it because I'm so uncomfortable listening to my own voice. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, yeah, so take a ton of notes. Those nuggets that are in there, um, there's there's like sort of a whole nother aspect of this um, that, that comes after customer discovery, which is sort of putting these results, what comes out of it into something real. Um, it's where I advise developing a customer persona um, or buyer persona. I talk about, there's a, there's a software tool called user stories. It's, it's used in software development, although it is applicable to every business in my perspective. And from my, from, in my opinion, rather not from my perspective, um, it's a phenomenal tool. And I would say, pull those things out. And um, it's, <laughs> It's hard because in this case, I, I do think that it's okay to do the judgment call. Okay, so I had some students, I had some students when I was at the, at the university teaching that were building a product around uh, child healthcare. And um, it was during the, the workshop on customer discovery. And I made one of them sit in front of me in a chair in front of a class of 40 students and customer interview me. Cause I was like, I'm a dad. I've got a kid. I'm, I'm in your customer segment. Let's do this. And, um, of course they bombed, like they bombed, they bombed so hard. 
which is part of the learning experience. You got to fail to learn a lot, usually. And um, what they missed was, so uh, I'm happy talking about it now at the time, it was a little weirder. Uh, I have a kid, my son was born with a heart condition and had to have emergent surgery, including a helicopter ride to Philadelphia and open heart surgery and all this sort of stuff. That was a very stressful, awful period in my life. And this kid was building a, a startup around parental and child health, and they never uncovered this story for me. And it would have, if they, and so I, I paused the class and I used it as a learning moment. I said, okay, well, let me tell you about this like very personal part of my life that's very emotional. It's, you know, it, it's, it's, it's tough to talk about, but it's real and raw and, and connects. And then the, the next conversation in the class was like, well, what do we do with that? And there's, there's a whole bunch of answers and some of it might be, okay, we should change this part of the product. Some of it might be, let's rethink a different customer persona. Maybe we should talk to 10 other parents of kids with heart defects. Let's go talk to these parents because they're very emotionally engaged and connected to this. Or, um, you know, they're, they're so in, they're so like emotionally on this level that our product is just, it, they just don't care because our product's so not connected to the things they actually care about. And so it's, it, you can't, sometimes it's a very often a judgment call, but it, and good customer discovery often leads to more customer discovery, which can be a pain thing, but, um, and people, this is so funny. Even when they're not friends and family, people will lie to you. And so one of the biggest mistakes that people do in customer discovery is they'll say, hey, here's my baby. What do you think of my baby? And I'm not telling you, you have an ugly baby, right? And that's what my startup is. It's my baby. And so, hey, this is my product. What do you think? Would you use it? Yeah, sure. I'd use it. Sure. Okay. Give me a hundred dollars. In exchange, I'll let you use my product. Nah, I don't have a hundred on me. Well, were you lying? <laughs> or, you know, and so people won't tell you your baby's ugly. Hmm. And um, and it, it often, it's, it's a hard thing. And that's why I like these open-ended customer discovery questions. Because people will give you much more real, much more authentic answers. And, and stories that are hard to quantify, sure, but they're... They're much more actionable to use a B school buzzword. It's an actionable lesson. That's I can nice do buzzword. something with it. It's a good buzzword. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if that answered your question, but no, it does. It does. It helps probably, answer it. You know, and one one sort of sort one of. idea people probably use a lot, right, is to get the real validation. Is is probably posting stuff on social media, for instance. People will tear you apart if it's a bad idea. Uh, <laughs> They'll yeah. rip you apart. You know. Yeah. That could be too negative, yeah. though. <laughs> it's so, that is such a, so that is such a, like, fraught, fraught way to do things because there's just so many unknown variables. There's so many unknown variables. There's so many, like, cognitive biases built into social media. Like, people worry about what they say because they're afraid what somebody else is going to perceive them. Mm -hmm. Like, social media is Customer discovery on social media is the fucking worst. So um, if you read, if you get into Steve Blank's, some of Steve Blank's writings, hmm. he'll talk about the customer development journey. And it starts with customer discovery. And that slowly turns into, or maybe not slowly if you're good at it, customer creation. Hmm. And social media can be like, and you can use one for the other. So if I'm doing an interview with somebody and I really uncover they love my shit, mm -hmm. I'm always asking them for their email, like, or their phone number or contact. So can I follow up with you when I finally build my thing? And, and those are great early customers that I've now created. Mm -hmm. um, but there's no pressure to do that. Cause if I talk to them and I, and I say, uh, you know, whatever it is, they, they, eh, I don't care. It's just, you know, whatever. 
then I, I don't waste my time with asking them more questions or getting their con or trying to sell them, trying to sell them or market to them. I just wouldn't bother, right? The there's sort of two ways, there's two ways to think about sales and marketing. One is I get so many freaking people and, and I have like a 2% success rate, but if I get enough people, that 2% success rate is enough to run my business. Hmm. And in my opinion, that works only if you're talking about Walmart and Coca-Cola and uh, I don't know, Toyota. Um, if you're a small business owner or a small startup or an early stage company or whatever, I think it makes a lot more sense to say, instead of targeting a million people, I'm, I'm going to find the hundred that really fucking give a shit. These are, these are the best hundred. Mm -hmm. These people really fucking love me. And I just have to figure out out of the million people who are the hundred. Because if I get them, they're going to stick with me. They're going to give me great feedback as I continue to grow and produce and develop whatever it is I'm doing. They're going to they're going to be evangelists when I make them happy. They're going to be the ones that tell their friends and family, like, um, and if you love 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 a product, you do this. I recommend people. You know, everyone asks for recommendations and gives recommendations. It's like because you love a thing, and mm -hmm. I would rather an entrepreneur or a small business owner find the people that really give a shit. Just like really, and it can be really weird, and that's a whole other conversation about designing a customer persona or a buyer persona um, and understanding sort of the user story behind why someone does what they do. And restaurants are a phenomenal example of this, by the way, trying to, trying to loop back to like the food and beverage world that you live in. Um, restaurants are a phenomenal example about this, by the way, especially if you live in this world, you'll very easily, like, but why do you go to the restaurant? I was hungry. Okay, if that were the case, I would be serving like protein bars mm -hmm. and water and fruit juice. You know, like, mm -hmm. but that's not why people go to restaurants. They they go to restaurants because, and there's lots of different reasons. It's I'm tired and don't feel like cooking. It's I wanted to go on a date and have a nice time. I really was excited to try this cuisine because I never had it before. Or I really wanted to have this cuisine because it's what I grew up with. And, I, the, you know, it's this connection to home. And, you know, I was really nostalgic for it. And understanding based on what you're producing or creating in your restaurant or, or food business and which of those connects to which thing, that's, that's an important thing to understand. And it's going to help you design your business and build a better menu and cook better food because you'll have a better understanding of why people do what they do. And so I, and I'll give you a great example of this. Um, outside of our business school, my business school building when I was in grad school, there was a hot dog guy. And there were okay hot dogs. And he understood that we were like between classes or whatever and speed. And, and price, because we're poor college kids, were like the only things we cared about, right? And he was so good. Like he was, he might, he made bank outside of that. Because, yeah, I forget. I have no idea. But it was like, here, it, it like, so he, every price point was on the dollar because he never had to make change. And like, it was either five bucks or 10 bucks, depending on which meal it was. You got mm -hmm. five bucks for one hot, 10 bucks for two hot, and it came with a soda, it came with a bag of chips, now get the hell out of here. Well, that's so, so different than if I'm going to a super nice steak restaurant in the middle of Midtown Manhattan with my wife at eight o'clock at night on her, at, at, on her birthday. Totally different experience. Those are, those are two different business verticals even. I would say mm -hmm. they're not, even though they're both selling food, those are not the same business. Mm -hmm. um, there's, there's, there's a great uh, white paper about this or blog post or case, I forget what it is about craft beer. I'm a craft beer nut as, as we've already learned from this, this talk. Craft, the reason you drink craft beer versus the reason you drink, you know, a national brand beer, so remarkably different. And like the business econ nerds have actually proven that these operate as two totally separate marketplaces.
<laughs> with different reasonings and different motivations and different customers and different user base. It's just so different. And like, it's not even people, they don't even compare them as um, what economists would call a substitute. It's just not, they're not substitutes. You, you, you can't substitute a Miller Lite against your local craft stout or IPA or whatever. It's just not the same. Mm -hmm. And so let's not even like craft beer and beer. Yeah. Okay. One of the words, it's not the same. And, um, oh my gosh, I forgot the original question. Are you like, you have me so spun up <laughs> on this thing that I forgot the original question. Holy <laughs> crap. Um, that's good. You keep asking shoot. yourself Ooh. your own questions and going off. So I know. You're, you're in a good this spot is, right now. You're in a good spot. This is this is why <laughs> I was good at teaching. It's because I could get through like a three hour uh, oh, yeah. class and just never shut up. That's great. Um, just undergrads will just stare at you. They'll never ask a question. <laughs> um, shoot, that's awful. I can't believe I forgot. Anyway, um, yeah. So I think it's really, really important to understand those motivations. And the only way you do that is by talking to people. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I'm going to shut up now because I've totally lost my train. Totally lost it. It's gone. No, it was a good, it was a good train um, to be on, though. It's very interesting. Yeah. It's, it's good. It's good stuff. So, so for these mill vets listening in, if they're they're starting up a food business, they got a they got a shitty idea that they're trying to figure out how to make it better, right? Through customer discovery and then some. What's uh what's some advice for those those specific mill vets? Speaking of mill vet audience starting up a business, what do you got for them? Mill vet mill vet starting up a business. Um spe specifically sort of the, the food and beverage restaurant sort of mm -hmm. e space. Yeah, yeah. Um so there's two things. There's sort of two things that you can do. The the first is Remember that you're a customer um, and try to put yourself in those shoes the next time you go out to a restaurant, whatever, whether it's like what you do or not like what you do, force yourself because we cognitively, this is why open and customer discovery is so important. We cognitively don't understand our own motivations a lot. Like we just don't, right? Uh, tell, tell any spouse when they're trying to decide where to go with their significant other, what their motivations are. And like the answer is like, just to, to so my wife makes a decision, just to like fucking just make, can you just make it? And so like you can, like the first customer discovery interview should be with yourself. Um, and it's sort of an advantage that people in this business, this sort of line of work has. And I think military vets are really good at this sort of thing because they can be dispassionate and they can put themselves in perspective of like, how important is this thing versus, you know, like, okay, I, I drove nuclear submarines for a living. When somebody gets mad at me for, for, for my shitty software product being shitty, like, okay, man, like it just doesn't all right, like that's the perspective here is just different. And so, um, yeah, so you can, the first customer is yourself and, and force yourself to really think about like, why are you making the decisions you're making? Um, and then the second is finding, talking to people until you get that foothold market. And this is actually one thing where I think, I think vets are bad at, like, because it's 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 generally an emotional sort of appeal that you're trying to look for. You're trying to find somebody like really emotionally connected or engaged with a problem. And like I, I said before, with like the whole, oh, am I just too lazy to eat and, and cook? Mm -hmm. Like if you're in Manhattan, we 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 both met in sort of the New York ecosystem. Like mm -hmm. I have friends in New York who just like don't even have kitchens, not yeah. really. You know, like that's just such a New York thing. And they eat out for very different reasons than the person in central Iowa who mm -hmm. has to drive an hour to get to a restaurant that's worth a damn, right? And so, like, think about some of the conditions that you're in, what you're trying to do, and what your customer's motivations are. It's it's Sometimes it's not hard to develop, like, those motivations without talking to customers. But you have to. And for military veterans who don't like have, I once got kicked out of a Target 
because I just stood <laughs> in the front and was asking for customer discovery interview. I was just like, hey, I need a late 30s mom in suburbia. Where do you go to find a late 30s? I need a hundred of them. Hmm. Where do you go to oh, okay? Front target. of the target. That's target, right? And um I until the target management asked me to let us fake it. <laughs> but like find where you think your customers already are, whatever that is, and go talk to them. Go talk to them. It might be very event-based. Um, if you're selling um if you're selling, say, uh hot sauce a hot sauce or a barbecue sauce, go find like the, we have, we have rodeos over at the, um, uh, where are the giants play? Uh, the Meadowlands. Oh. We have, we have rodeos that come in town and this is outside New York, New Jersey. This is like the most Southern country place, but we still have a rodeo come in about two or three times a year mm. and people go. If you're if I'm selling barbecue sauce and hot sauce, my first starting point is a place where that group of people congregates. Because those are the people who are going to be – they're in New Jersey, in New York. They have probably some family or personal connection to barbecue or hot sauce from their time living in the country of the South. They're really – these are the people who are going to be really, really engaged, who are going to – they're going to come and be like, listen, man, I lived in Charleston, South Carolina – my entire life and you have shitty barbecue sauce, right? Like that's, and that's, that's good. Like that's good. Cause you know, what's shitty now and you can fix that part. Mm -hmm. um, so find, take a stab at where you think your customers are, go and talk to them. You might find out that those are not your customers or you might find really interesting stuff about your product. Um, so yeah, that, that, that would be my advice. And, Military, we're the one, yeah. Military vets, we're not good at like going out and talking to people sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. It's a good point. We're just like not the most emotionally, socially connected humans. It's just not what we do. And so, like, mm -hmm. force yourself to get out of that comfort zone. Force yourself. Or find a co founder who is. That's the other. If you can find a co founder who's like super like outgoing and personable, you know, you know what? I, mm -hmm. I should take that back. Submariners. We are anti-social assholes. We are so like uncomfortable. Um, so I, I won't speak to the other branches of the military, but but we in general are pretty can be pretty anti-social. Um, but yeah, that's the advice. That's the advice. Go find people who you think are customers and talk to them. Figure out if they are your customers or not, or learn something about how to make your your shit better. So. That's yeah. great advice. I like that advice. Along with the hustle, hustle, go to Target or go to a rodeo or wherever, wherever you got to go, just get there and do it. Right. It's, it is, um, finding those like silly little sort of hacks. And I hate like hacks is such like a Silicon Valley buzzword too. But like, um, I, I now I'm, I'm working, I can't talk too much about what I'm doing because it runs into some SEC rules. Um, but I'm working at the intersection of ocean tech and climate right now. And um, what I figured out, I needed like really rich people who liked the ocean. And so I went to aquariums and I looked at the donor wall on the front of the aquarium. If you like got a, like one of those rooms named after you, you have enough money to donate hundreds of thousands of dollars to an aquarium and you care about the ocean. Hmm. And like, if I had like if in, in my, I could not have like, you couldn't, no one would have given me that advice. Um, but it was a great way to figure like, Oh crap. Like this, the intersection of like, I have money, care about the ocean. The, this is, this is where they go. This is what they do. They all huh. are here. And so um, it was a phenomenal. It has opened so many doors for me personally. And so if you can find that stuff, whew, the rodeo, the target, the aquarium, thank you wall, <laughs> like find it for your company or business or restaurant or product or whatever it is you're doing, find those people. And it's okay if no one likes your shit. It's okay if no one likes your shit. It probably means that those are just not the right first people. Hmm. It means you need to find somebody else for some other reason. So that's pretty yeah. good right there. That's that slick nuke thinking that we started the conversation with. See, it's coming out now. <laughs> and 
this is yeah this is part of the whole like concept of like your idea sucks because baked mm -hmm. into the idea is a group of people you think are going to buy your shit hmm. and in in reality there's a good chance that you have the wrong group of people in your head mm -hmm. it's a totally different group of people and you've got to be surprised you have to let yourself be surprised hmm. it's it's a it's a tough it's a tough balance because you got to balance it against like the whole like entrepreneurship is hard and everyone tells me my shit sucks mm -hmm. you know so yeah yeah that's great though well well it's been a super super informative of conversation now i think uh i hope a lot of mill vets listen in really take it for heart and go after it with your advice because it applies across the board any business right but we're talking to food and beverage on entrepreneurs but you can use it any 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 business same same concepts apply obviously so appreciate yeah. you coming on and i don't know anything else you wanted to to wrap up and tell anybody so so first off i'll i'll so i'll say two more things mm -hmm. and i'll shut up i will totally shut up uh <laughs> and let you close that first is a, is a shameless plug i, I run a newsletter at, in the ocean tech space called blue x Go to bluex.news and sign up for me and, and tell me, give me customer feedback on what you like or don't like about it. And um, if you find, if you're a military vet and you're, you're starting businesses or startups, you need a hand, find me on LinkedIn, uh, Will Lutz, L-U-T-Z. Come and find me, happy to connect. I'll never not pick up the phone or eat, respond to an email from a mill vet. It's just, that's just not how I work. So um, if I can be helpful in any way, let me know. That's it. Those are my two. Then I'll, I'll let you, I'll show you. I don't know. That's super great. I mean, that's, that's one cool thing about this mill vet community, right? I think if you, you know, once you get out of the military, you start running into vets and running the same circles, you're, you guys kind of light up and you're like, I know, I know what you went through. I know what you went through and you just kind of hit it off and it's a smoother conversation. Right. So that's uh, that's cool to hear. There's the, the, one of the truisms I've learned in my career is that sometimes, and it sucks sometimes, but like, mm -hmm who you know matters often more than what you know. Yeah. And in our world, no vets tend to really supportive of each other. Mm -hmm. Like you'll talk about, they'll talk about like the Harvard network or the MIT network or the Stanford network. We've got the Milvet network and it's not bad. It's Absolutely. pretty damn good. Like we always pick up the phone for each other. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's, I love that sort of aspect of it. It's pretty cool. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, I, I worked for a few years back when I met you, I was working at Fordham university, helping run their, um, military yeah, student right. program. And that's what we'd say the same thing, you know, we're the Fordham Rams. We're like the Ram network is huge. It's all over New York city. It's very, very predominant, but, but you got that Milvet Fordham network and you just, you could reach the top of whatever company you want. If there's somebody there. Yeah. As a vet. It's, it's pretty, you find the, you it's find pretty the right impressive. Guy. Yeah. 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 It's cool though. All right. Well, well, been a pleasure, man. Super informative for myself and hopefully our viewers. So thanks again for your time. Yeah. Take care, brothers. Good seeing you. Yeah, man.